Okay, so our presentation today is on uh, the express entry system. There's been a lot of changes that have happened um, just in the past couple of weeks. Um, and we wanted to take a chance to explain to you uh, what the system is and really how to navigate your way through the system. So um, some of you probably already know about what Express Entry is, um, but for th those people who um, are not sure, I'd like to just give you some of the basics uh, of what the system is. Essentially, Express Entry, first of all, is a permanent residence application. Um, when you apply for it, you are applying for permanent residence, which is essentially um, the status that allows you to stay permanently in Canada, work anywhere you like, study where, anywhere you like. You're treated almost as a citizen, except you can't vote. If you, under the new citizenship laws that knock on wood, is going to be um, soon uh, uh, in, in effect, um, then um, you will only need to uh, live in Canada for three years as a permanent resident before uh, you, need, you can get citizenship. And express entry is an economic category. So essentially, people who are um, able to apply under express entry are applying because of their skills and their background. Um, and so the, uh, we have three main categories that have been in place before the new express entry system came into place the skilled worker class, Canadian experience class, and the skilled trades class. And they are still there because in order to get into the express entry system, you have to qualify under one of these categories. And we're going to talk about in detail of those categories uh, in a little bit. Now, express entry is a federal program. So if you wanted to live in any of the provinces or territories, um, in Canada, um, you can apply through the express entry system except Quebec. Quebec is special and they um, like uh, they have their own programs. So um, if you don't if you want to live in Quebec, you would have to apply through the Quebec programs. Express entry is everything except Quebec. And um, it doesn't matter if you're not living in Canada. A lot of people will be able to get through the express entry system and get permanent residence, um, even if they don't live in Canada. Of course, if you live in Canada, uh, you can certainly apply. And certainly, there are a lot of advantages to first having uh, worked and studied in Canada as well, as we'll see. So let's really talk about what exactly the, how the, exactly the express entry system works. So first of all, the express entry system is an online system. And to get into the online system, you first have to um, have an online profile. So how do you make an online profile? Well, first you have to qualify. And you qualify uh, by, as we had talked before, uh, qualifying through the Federal Skilled Worker class, Canadian Experience class, and Federal Skilled Trades class. Okay, so you qualify. Um, what happens then? Well, if you qualify, then you can get into the express entry pool. And it's not a real pool, it's an online pool, okay? And you stay there for one year. But it's the trick is not to stay in the pool because when you're in the pool, you haven't actually made an application for permanent residence. You just have a chance to make an application for permanent residence. Um, the trick is not just to get into the pool. The trick is also to get out of the pool. And how do you get out of the pool? Well, every two weeks or so, the government announces a draw. And the government will announce a number for the draw and if your number it's called the comprehensive ranking system number um, if your number is above that score that the government announces then you can get out of the pool you can get an invitation to apply and actually apply for permanent residence 
groups. If you don't, uh, if your number is below, so say, for example, the government might announce uh, this draw is 487. Now, if my number is 489, then fantastic. I will get an invitation to apply. But if my number is 486, then I have to stay in the pool and hopefully wait until the next time and see what the number will be for the next draw. Okay, so let's talk first about how to get into the pool. To get into the pool, you need to qualify under one of these categories. For the federal skilled worker class, we're looking at a combination of things. First of all, it's really important that you have one year of high skilled, continuous, which means that there is no, um, there is no break in your, in your work. Uh, you need uh, one year continuous high skilled um, and you need to have um, uh, full-time work. So full-time work is considered 30 hours a week. Um, and then, um, so you need to have that one year of work experience under your belt before you can even qualify under the first category. This is just the federal skilled worker category that we're talking about right now. Um, and under the, uh, for that work experience, um, you can also add together part-time work if it's, as long as it's continuous. So for example, if I've done um, two years of part-time work experience, that's 15 hours per week, I can add that together to equal to one year of full-time work experience, as long as it's continu continuous, as long as I didn't have a break in between. Um, you know, going on vacation is fine because I'm still employed, but I didn't quit my job and then go on vacation without another job um, and then two months later start, a, start another job, okay? It also has to be one year within the same occupation. So that's the basic amount of work experience that you'll need to qualify for this. And then after that, we also look at your language skills. So everybody, unfortunately, has to do a language exam. It doesn't matter if you have a PhD in English literature. Um, you have to still do uh, a language exam. And the language exams that we look at, it's the IELTS, I-E-L-T-S, and the CELPIP, C-E-L-P-I-P. And both of them are the general categories. Um, and for the skilled worker class, you're looking at 6.0 in each. Not I don't care about the general score. I care about each of the scores, reading, writing, listening, and speaking. And for the, um, uh, for the uh, self, if you're looking at seven, okay? And this is just to qualify to get into the pool. To get out of the pool, you may need higher language scores. But right now, just to get into the pool for the federal skilled worker class, this is what we need. Now, after that, um, another thing that you really need to have is you need to have financial savings. Um, that, that is your own, uh, in your own accounts, okay? Um, for um, a, a single person, you're going to need a little bit under 13,000 right now. Um, for, if, if, as you have more family members, each family member, you're gonna add around two, 3,000 there. Um, and then you're going to also, then after those three basic things are met, then we look at your background. So we look at your education levels, we look at your age, um, language skills, and if you have other work experience or how many years of work experience you have in the past 10 years, um, and you need to meet um, at least 67 points. If you have family in Canada, that gives you a few points, okay? Um, so that's to get into the pool for the federal skilled worker class. If you have a job offer as well, that will also um, be good if you have an LMIA, okay? Um, the Canadian experience class is the second one. Now, the Canadian experience class um, is one where the work ex experience is really different from the federal skilled worker class. So for the Canadian experience class, your work experience has to be Canadian work experience, 
okay? Um, so you have to have that work experience in Canada. It has to be high-skilled. It has to be one year in the past three years. And um, so the one year within the past three years, it does not have to be continuous, but it can't be self-employed. In the skilled worker class, you can get, um, you can use um, self-employment, but in Canadian experience class, you have to be employed. And, and usually what we're looking for is a T4 from the employer, okay? Um, and you need to have one year, 30 hours a week, and it has to be high-skilled. Now, um, that work experience can't be obtained while you are studying for the Canadian experience class. However, for this federal skilled worker class, your work experience can be obtained while you are studying. So a lot of students can actually qualify for the federal skilled worker class in Canada, even if they have not graduated yet. And, okay, so that is different for the Canadian experience class to qualify under this class. You do have to uh, finish or not be studying full-time in order to get the work experience and that work experience has to be legal so you know you can't just quit school and um, not graduate and just work without a work permit it has to be legally obtained in Canada so once you have that work experience then you also have to pass your language exam and uh, the language exam depending on uh, what level it is, what skill level it is. For the most part, you're looking at similar levels as the federal skilled worker class. Oops. Okay. Now, the skilled to trades class is for a limited um, uh, occupations. It's mostly for people who are in the construction trades or also the chefs and the cooks as well. Um, and in order to do this, you have to have two out of five years of work experience. You have to pass your language exams, but that, those language exams are much lower than the Canadian experience class or the federal skilled worker class. And you also need to, in order to qualify, you need to either have an LMIA or uh, a provincial certification from one, one of the provinces for your trade. Okay, so this is how to get in to the pool. Now, how do we get out? Okay, so once you get into the pool, as soon as you, we submit your application, and we submit your online profile, you're gonna get um, a scoring sheet, okay? And right now, we're looking at two things for your score. The human capital score, which is the main thing that most people are going to have, everybody's gonna have a human capital score. So that's the main thing. Um, and then we're gonna look at the provincial nominee, nomination if you have that. So the comprehensive ranking system, that's your points. Um, and so this is your points to get out of the pool. All right, so people are gonna say, well, how am I supposed to get out of the pool? What counts to get out of the pool? Okay, so we're looking at, first of all, age. Uh, age, the optimum age. Now, th this is not my criteria. This is the government's criteria. Okay, so please don't uh, blame me for their criteria because <laughs> anyone, according to the government, when you get to the age of 30, uh, you're, every time you have a birthday, your points are going to go down. So essentially, once you um, reach your birthday for 30, every birthday is not so happy if you are still in the pool because it goes down five points in your 30s, five to six points in your 30s, and in your 40s, it goes down like 10 points, okay? So um, the thing about age, you can't really change your age. The only thing you can do about age is to apply early, as soon as possible, before your next birthday. Sorry, guys. I, it's not my criteria, okay? Um, okay, so education, we're really looking at post-secondary education. Um, essentially, to be competitive, we're looking at at least to have a degree of three years or more. 
uh, to be to get those points. And um, once you have um, at least two two post-secondary degrees, so at least one that's three years or more. So, for example, if you have a bachelor's, and then if you even have a six months uh, post-secondary diploma or or one year post, even if it's a college degree, that's great because that will get you to another level. Masters, of course, PhD, that's great too. Professional um, uh, designation, that's great too. Um, so we're really uh, looking, but if you have the two uh, degrees or certificates, uh, post-secondary, that is really good. Uh, we, it does need to be from a, a university or college. So not something that, you know, you get like a Microsoft certification or something, okay? Um, so that's education. Language is something that is really, really important because as you can understand, um, Express Entry is a competition. And essentially, there are so many points for language that to get out, to get into the pool, you're looking at sixes. For IELTS, to get out of the pool, I want to see, usually I'm looking at seven, seven point oh for um, uh, reading, writing, and speaking, and eight for listening. So really, um, uh, we are looking at, um, you know, it's really important to, to make sure you get the highest level for language. Oh, and also for your education, if you got your education uh, degrees or diplomas outside of Canada, that needs to be assessed um, under as an ECA education credential assessment uh, before we can count it okay because you see everything in express entry you have to prove you can't just answer those questions because once you get an ita uh, you need to show that you've done it and in fact you can't even get into the pool until you've done an eca and you've done your language exam and you've gotten the results now Canadian work experience is really important as well. And I'm putting relevant Canadian work experience because not all work experience in Canada will count. Uh, it does not, it's, this is the work experience that is really similar to the Canadian experience class work experience, except it's uh, within the past 10 years instead of Canadian experience classes within the past three years. So Canadian work experience that we're looking at is work experience that's high skilled, it's employment, uh, not self-employment, and it's work experience that um, you've done in Canada while you are not studying, okay? Uh, well, while you are not full-time studies. Uh, if you have foreign work experience that is high-skilled, we can also get points for that as well. And then, uh, spouses. So if you have, you're, you, you're married or you have a common law spouse. In Canada, common law spouse is um, someone who you have lived in a conjugal relationship. So not roommates, but you know, at least girlfriend, boy, uh, girlfriend, boyfriend, girlfriend, girlfriend, boyfriend, boyfriend, you know, that relationship, uh, marriage-like relationship. And um, and you have um, uh, lived together for at least one year. So if you have a common law spouse and they're not Canadian, then uh, you would be, uh, your points would be under the marriage, married person's category. In general, a single person will likely get a few more points than a married person, unless you have a super spouse. Uh, if you have a super spouse who has a high level of education and can speak English well and has Canadian work experience, then they might add a few more points to you. Um, provincial nominee programs right now are the only thing that sort of guarantees that you are going to be selected uh, and issued an invitation to apply. We'll talk about that in a bit. Some people often get provincial nominee program, all provincial nominee programs confused with the express entry provincial nominee program. So it's only express entry provincial nominee programs that will give you 600 points, okay? With 600 points, you're virtually guaranteed to be able to apply. Um, 
and we'll talk about that in a bit. Now, um, there are a few uh, other new programs um, that have come into place, and we are going to uh, go to the next slide, and I'm going to talk about the new changes, okay? So, the new changes that have come into place are, um, first of all, if you have studied and completed a program in Canada. So, if you have completed a um, a, a three-year program with like a bachelor's, a master's program, a PhD program, and master's PhD and the professional, were, were, there are specific professions in there, uh, then you get 30 points. So the master's professional program, PhD is normally longer than three years, but um, the other programs, it doesn't have to be three years if it's a master's or professional program. But Otherwise, if it's a three-year program, master's, PhD, you get 30 points. One to two-year program, you get 15 points. So that's previous study in Canada. Those are for students who have completed their studies in Canada. Um, then there's also a lot of changes for people who have employer-specific work permits. What employer-specific work permits are, um, are work permits that actually have a, an, an employer specified on your work permit. So in these kind of work permits, you can only work for the employer on your work permit. So they do not include open work permits, like postgraduate work permit or uh, open spousal work permit. Um, so those would not count. Um, but if you have an employer-specific work permit, like a LMIA work permit, well, before LMIAs, they were the holy grail for express entry. If you had an LMIA, you got 600 points. You can apply automatically almost. But now, LMIA points have gone down from 600 to 50 points. So for a lot of people who don't have high uh, skills in other ways, like, you know, the, if you're older, if you don't have that much edu post-secondary education, if you, uh, you can't speak English that well, then guess what? Even if you could get into the pool, it's going to be difficult for you to get out when the LMIA is only worth 50 points. Now, if your scores are pretty good, otherwise, though, you know, if you're younger and you have a post-secondary degree, etc., 50 points is still worth a bit, uh, quite a bit, and it could really bolster you to the next level. So it's not hopeless uh, if you have an LMI. It's just that it's no longer a guarantee, and you have to at least um, have a pretty good score otherwise, uh, even with an LMI. Uh, there are other employer-specific work permits, though, um, as well, that ha are benefiting from this. Because before, other employer-specific work permits, like intra-company work permits, NAFTA work permits, postdoctoral fellow uh, work permits, right, that are employer-specific, you don't get any points for that. Now, you actually do. And the nice thing about it is, uh, you, so you get 50 points. You don't have to do an LMIA if you're on one of those work permits. Um, as long as you've worked in the position for at least one year for the employer on the work permit. So you, you, if you've changed uh, employers or if you've just got your work permit for that work uh, employer, so you just entered the country, well, you have to work for one year before you can get those 50 points. Another really nice thing, nice change, is that the job offer is no longer a permanent job offer. Uh, I know that some, for example, doctoral fellows, uh, you know, there is no such thing as a permanent situation for most people for a postdoctoral fellow. But you can get a two-year contract, for example. So as long as your job offer is good for one year from the time that you've obtained PR. Now, this is really important because if you have just a one-year job offer and your work permit is only good for one year and your employer says you have to leave in one year, that may not be enough because it will take six months, approximately six months, to even get your permanent residence. 
So I would say for this to qualify, you need at least sort of like a two-year um, job offer and um, to give yourself at least one and a half years um, to uh, get and obtain PR. Now, so for some people, that's pretty good news. Um, and for other people, it might not be as good news. Um, but there is basically essentially now without the LMIA sort of guarantee, there is only one more guarantee in order for you to get um, the invitation to apply. And that's through the provincial nominee programs. So what provincial nominee programs, um, there are agreements essentially between each province and territory with the federal government. Because remember, immigration is a federal jurisdiction, but uh, the federal government has made some agreements with each province to say, hey, we're going to let you pick a certain number of people who you think uh, you know, would be great for your province, and you can then select them to be uh, part of your program. Now, every province has their own pro uh, programs. And each province has a lot of programs, not just express entry programs. Okay, so you have to be really careful about this. Um, just because you have a provincial nominee nomination does not necessarily mean you get 600 points. You have to have some provinces have programs to obtain 600 points for express entry. Okay, so I've listed some of these provinces here. Um, some of them are currently closed. Ontario is currently closed. Nova Scotia is currently closed. PEI, they're currently filled. They say they still look at applications, um, like, you know, but they're not going to give you uh, 600 points until you're, uh, until maybe next year when the program is opened. Um, but so essentially each program has their own selection pro, uh, criteria. When you are, some of them you can apply directly to them and some of them you have to be first into the pool and then they have they they'll invite you to apply with them okay so if you're interested in um living uh in any of the provinces here the provincial nominee program might be a good option to see if you can get 600 more points um so you can be assured um your permanent residence all right, so what are we predicting for draws? Um, well, let's talk about some of the facts because really it's, it's kind of a, um, it's a guessing game, really. And we can only make educated guesses for the draws right now. Um, in terms of the, so the LMIAs, points for LMIAs, decreased significantly from 650. So what does that mean? Well, to me, that means that uh, the points based on this should come down because a lot of people who had the LMIAs, uh, for example, a lot of people in the trades uh, may not have that high level of education or English skills um, and or even age. So a lot of those people will now um, probably only get 200 to 300 points um, and so instead of the 600 points so the points overall uh, probably would go down if for this fact alone but that's not the only fact out there right so because the other workers you know a lot of the other workers that are employer specific work permits well they're going to get 50 more points so based on that you know the points could also float up now it's not going to float up significantly to you know a hundred more points it's going to float up maybe a little bit less than 50 points because you're looking at overall each uh month uh, each uh, uh sorry each draw so twice a month right the government is going to normally nominate a certain number they have a number in their mind and that is actually really important um because the students get 15 to 30 points well that might push up the score a little bit not not that much, right? Not like 100 points, but it might push it up a few points. Uh, this is going to be probably uh, a much more significant um, 
because the target quota is expanding to 74,000. Now, this year, so far, the government has essentially drawn around 28,000 people only. So what does that mean? Now, 74,000, and it does include family members. So I'm hoping that at least the 28,000, we're looking at maybe double the amount. Well, if we're looking at double the amount, then that score should probably, probably go down a little bit, right? Because um, the more, um, the more people they draw out of the pool, well, then um, it, basically you're look, going from the scores. Um, there's less people that are higher, and then you're you're moving down. You're moving down into the pool. And in fact, uh, we've recently in a Law Society summit, um, the uh, program officers from Express Entry. Um, have come and told us, well, really, their target range, they're really looking at people who are above 450 points. So we'll see. We'll see how it goes. But uh, it seems to be pretty hopeful, um, at least for people that are above, who are above the 450, to, um, uh, to get drawn in the next year or so. All right. Here's my final pieces of advice. Uh, what should you do? First of all, it's a numbers game. It's a competition. So when there's a competition, you want to get in while there's less comp competitors out there. You guys, you know, are the few people who are coming to see my, <laughs> you know, uh, the, the, my, uh, uh, my webinar, you know, a lot of other people are not getting the proper legal advice. They don't know about the system yet. So in my mind, I like to, to take advantage of that, get in while the number of people in the pools are low, because I'm thinking that hopefully, you know, um, the numbers will get lower, uh, are lower while there's less people in the pool. And make sure you get all the points you can get. And that's, um, you know, that, that is everyone saying, of course, you get all the points you can get. But the thing is to how to get all the points you can get, right? Um, language is really, really important. Uh, you got to prepare for those language exams. Uh, if it's not, especially if it's not your first language. Um, get those ECAs, you know. Um, a lot of times when people enter themselves into the pool and then they come to us and they say, well, how do I get drawn? I, I look at their points and I say, you know what? You're, you're supposed to get a lot more points than you actually have stated. It's all about sometimes um, knowing what to count and how to count it and how to enter that information when um, we put you into the pool. But, you know, sometimes 10 points, 5 points, 15 points can make all the difference in the world. Team up with your spouse. If you have a spouse, um, then, you know, sometimes it takes a while before you can get those scores. A lot of it is work experience. So, for example, if you are a student in Canada, you're going to be a student for a while, right? Like a lot of you PhD students, you're going to be here for a while studying. Well, if you have a spouse, then that spouse can get Canadian work experience points because they can get an open work permit while you have, um, uh, while you have the, um, while you you have your study permit. So you want to make sure that people do, we're not wasting time here, right? If your spouse is able to work, get get them to work in a high skill job, right? And you can get some points there. So we'll we can do an evaluation and it's best to basically plan early for immigration. Um, even if you think, oh, I don't qualify yet, you got to plan early to make sure that eventually um, you will maximize your chances of getting your scores as early as possible. And you have to submit a perfect application. Uh, ITAs, uh, are sometimes when you get that ITA, you are so happy, okay? Because yay, you finally have the ITA. But guess what? If you get the ITA and you can't prove everything that you have proven, that uh, you, you have to prove, everything, all the answers that you put into the pool, you have to do that, okay? So 
for a, we we gather 90% of the documents to make sure that we have the evidence to prove it. But sometimes um, you might not even know this, but you know there are different rules. If you don't submit a perfect application, you will likely get a rejection. And so after going through all of that, you can get a rejection after you know so long and finally getting the ITA. Uh, now we have also um, have been told by the government that they are also thinking of um, increasing points uh, for people who have siblings in Canada and for people who have high French language skills, English and like bilingual language skills. So if you're not one of those people, then guess what? You gotta get it, get in while the going is good. Okay? You gotta make sure you submit your application because if you're waiting, say you wait in and you get an ITA and then you submit your application six months later is refused, guess what? When the rules change and you don't you can't compete anymore, then that's going to be a heartbreak. Okay. So uh, that's all my advice for today. Um, if you want, we really highly suggest that you come for personal consultation uh, with our firm. We'll ha we have three lawyers at our firm right now. Um, all of us, we can give you a personal consultation and talk about your options. Okay, so um, that's it for today. And uh, thank you so much uh, for joining us. And uh, we'll see you next time. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Of course. Don't, don't wait, I have oh, questions yeah. for you. <laughs> yes, yeah, sorry, Otto. I totally forgot. Oh. We have to have okay. some questions and answers here. Question and answer period. Okay. So I Otto. have been busy answering everyone's questions. Um, the questions that have been put up, I am answering them privately to, to all the individuals who are answering them. So we will get through them today. Okay. But there's some questions that we're getting repeatedly that, um, Elizabeth, we want you to cover. Yep. Okay, there's three that are coming up over and over again. Mm -hmm. um, one of the questions that a lot of people have right now is we want to know when the PNP program for Ontario is expected to open to get again and if there's any gossip about when we're looking at that program reopening. Okay. So, uh, here's the thing, uh, as, oh, sorry, as part of the, um, the Canadian Bar Association, um, uh, I've been privy to some conversations um, from the officers uh, at the Ontario Prevention Omni Program who have said um, that they don't, that right now they're trying to fix some of the backlog in the system and they are looking to fix that before they open up the program again so we are definitely i mean it's already november 28th so we're really not looking at the program starting in november like they had started said before when the program closed in may uh probably not this year um we're hoping that maybe early next year um that um they might um uh, they, they might uh, start it again. Um, we're not sure if the program is going to be exactly the same or if they are going to be um, making some changes. Now, um, sorry, that's all I can give with regard to uh, the expectations. But um, what we do is we have a newsletter. Um, and you can go onto our website and sign up for the newsletter. And let me see if I can pull up our, and we will actually be, um, uh, we will actually be sending out news when we get actual news on, um, uh, on, on the uh, Provision Omni program opening or other immigration news for, uh, through our newsletter uh, uh, group. So um, I can, uh, if you go on lmlawgroup.com uh, and uh, and log on to uh, our website and go to the contact us page, then we we can then um, uh, then we can certainly then uh, sign. You can sign up, and we will send you that information. Okay, 
So this is one that I'm getting a lot and a lot and a lot of because we have so many students here. Okay. Can you please explain work experience that is gained from doing teaching assistant jobs and research assistant jobs? Can I use them for federal skilled worker applications? Can I use them for CC applications? When can we use them and when can we not? Okay, so as students, um, you can, you could, you may qualify for the federal skilled worker program by using work experience that you gained while you're studying, including research assistant and uh, teaching assistant positions, but they have to meet certain criteria. So, uh, for example, you have to be paid for that work. Right. Um, and what is payment is an interesting situation for some students. Um, there's a there is a gray area sometimes between what is a scholarship that is just giving you money to study um, and what is considered paid research assistantship or a teaching assistantship um, where you won't get that money unless you actually work. Um, but certainly we can use that to qualify you and get you into the pool for the skilled worker class. Now, the problem is, is that you can't use that to get you points to get out of the pool because that work experience is gained while you are studying. And so therefore, um, the, the work experience points that you get from, to get out of the pool, uh, you can't get that from that. So you can get into the pool, but not to get out. But, but, we still have a lot of students who don't, even though you can't get the work experience, Canadian work experience to get out of the pool, <laughs> they don't need it. They have enough points just by using and getting into the pool, they'll have enough points uh, to get out of the pool. Does that make sense? Have I thoroughly confused people or does that make sense to you, Adol? Yeah, I think that makes sense um but one of the questions as a follow-up to that is a lot of people are asking that the work that they're doing is scholarship based so it's part of a scholarship will that get them points for federal skilled worker like i said um it depends on what the situation is every there are so many different kinds of programs if it is a sc pure scholarship for you it doesn't matter if you work or not then likely you won't qualify. Um, we, but if it is something where you have to work in order to get the money, then it could qualify. So um, we would have to, I would have to look at your documents and I have to speak with you and we would need to get letters, for example, from your supervisor uh, to prove and, uh, um, the fact that it is a qualifying work experience. Okay. Another thing that's quite confusing from some of the new changes that a lot of people are asking about is getting points for the employer-specific work permits. Mm -hmm. um, we know that your job offer has to be valid for at least one year. Mm -hmm. um, how can this be shown? How can a job offer be demonstrated to be valid for at least one year? Well, we are looking at a couple of things. We're looking at the employment contracts and we're looking at the employer um, and we're uh, we're looking at um, the letters from the employers. Um, so, uh, you know, that's normally what how we show the evidence of that. Um, each situation is dif different. I would really have to look at the contracts, and I really have to, um, you know, we look at how to draft letters from the employer um, to ensure that um, it clearly shows that the job offer is for a certain amount of time. Now, if you have a permanent job offer. That is certainly a okay. Okay, um, as long as we can show that the contract does not restrict you from working uh, permanently, that's also fine. Um, but what I'm saying is, right now, you don't just need to have a permanent job offer. You can also even have a two-year contract, and that would satisfy the 50 points that you would get for the employer-specific work permit. And. For the one year, mm -hmm. is this from the date of the application or from the day that I obtain my permanent residency? The day that you obtain your permanent residence. So therefore, that's why I'm saying one year is not enough because it'll take at least six months or so for you to get 
your permanent residence through express entry. Um, and you need to have worked for the employer for one year. So um, not you don't have to work for on that work permit, but so if you, for example, had a three-year contract and you worked for that employer for one year, um, and then you know you you had another work permit, extended that work permit, that's fine. Um, but um, if it's not an LMIA uh, work ex uh, work permit, you have to have worked for that employer for one year, and then. Um, also be able to show that you'll have a job offer for one year from the time that they give you the permanent residence. Um, last question. We've been getting quite a few of them, so I picked the top five <laughs> to ask you. Um, again, it's a lot of students, so people want to know uh, for work experience, can I count my internships or my co-ops? So for the Canadian experience? For Canadian experience class? So for Canadian experience class, no. Um, while you are studying or while you're a full-time student um, and you have that study permit, no. Uh, it starts counting as soon as you apply for your post-grad work permit. As soon as you apply for your postgraduate work permit, even though you don't have your work permit yet, you are allowed to study uh, work full-time. So that's when we start counting it. Okay, so there are still a bunch of people who have asked questions. I will continue going through them, um, but those were the major themes that had come across, um, and I will continue to be answering everybody privately. Thanks a lot, Liz. Okay, thank you, Adel. Take care, everyone. Bye. Bye.